Good morning from the KLV. Today we're flying to Zurich for the series The Portrait Of to meet with a good friend of mine, Mr. Link. There are few people who fit the description of a collector better and not just regarding watches. Talking about watches, I'm wearing this Rolex 4315 also known as the King Midas, and Christian has a very special project in mind for this particular piece, as he wants to make a custom dial out of a piece of meteorite he owns. I promise you, this is gonna be an interesting video. <laughs> this is it. This feels like a nice living room. Yeah, the last time you saw it, it was all concrete, remember? It was but like I just also enjoyed it because it was a little bit more raw. Everything was just stuffed in. Yeah, I'm sorry we pimped it up. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> You got some new additions to the collection though, I see. Yes, yes. Um, these are actually um, some of my new favorite pieces. Um, I don't know, I, you're, you're a young guy, so you don't remember 1993, right? I don't. Because that was the year I was born, to be honest. <laughs> That's funny. It was also the year that this movie was born, uh, the first uh, Jurassic Park. That's one of my favorite movies, but yeah. this is a movie prop. It's a real movie prop. Like these are the puppets that Phil Tippett, the special effect guy, who actually also worked on Star Wars in 1977. Uh, he built these, and these are like stop motion puppets they used in the movie. Because I feel like you're moving away a little bit from the taxidermy. You started off with taxidermy, yeah, right? Exactly. I can still see some tigers and bears and stuff, but yeah. more even, in my opinion crazy stuff with crazy stories. For me, a exactly. tiger is a tiger. But if I see something like this, I'm like, why is it here? Yeah, yeah, I think everything has to be infused with a story that it attracts me and it makes me like wanting it in the gallery because it, it just adds to the atmosphere. Yeah, the thing is, I, I think it's very similar to watches. I, I never look for something specific. I usually, uh, I, I come across something and it just catches my eye. Like these stones here, um, these are called uh, Gogot. They're from France. This is not an artwork, this is a stone. No, it's a stone. So these grow in a, in a cave. It takes uh, hundreds of thousands of years to be like that. So it's, it's like water taking its course over time. It's uh, sand that gets compressed by the water. And after a couple of hundred thousand years, they are like formed like this. It's very heavy. Damn. So some stuff in here is like totally natural. I, I guess the egg is a real egg too. That's an like, <coughs> extinct bird, yes. The Apornis, it's uh, the giant um, elephant bird. It was like almost as twice as big <laughs> as an ostrich. <laughs> <clears throat> and it's extinct. Uh, in the 1750s it got extinct. It came from the island of uh, Madagascar. Ah, uh, yeah. And they found maybe, uh, there is an ever, I think there is an estimate of 30 pieces worldwide that are still intact, like not broken. And how so about this thing though? That is insane. Yeah, now we go even further back in the in the timeline, now we are hitting 70 million years <laughs> BC. But stuff like uh, this, this just doesn't come on your path, right? You have to find it or locate it or yeah, source it, yeah. have the connections, I guess. Exactly, you meet like other uh, collectors and dealers and they, they get to know your taste and um, yeah, they, they offer me these pieces. I mean, course. it's the same with a watch, sure. If I just walk around, I check stores, I check auctions, I check collectors, I will hit up a couple exactly. dages or submariners or whatever. But really, these specific types of pieces, you have to be in the business for quite some time to get something that is this impressive. Yeah, yeah, we just, I, we just hanged it up about three days ago. 
before because I really wanted you guys to see it. And, and what, what kind of dinosaur bird is it? It's a Pterodon. I, I probably say it wrong. Ah. <laughs> Christian? Yes? Is this a real human skull? It is. Watching me right now? Yes, it is. It is. Are you serious? Yes. This it's is crazy. a real school? Yes, it's from the artist Pippi Lotti Rist. She's a contemporary artist from Switzerland. Um, she does a lot of work with videos and projections. And um, the funny thing is she, she bought this in my shop that I had about four years ago. But she's a pretty famous artist, right? Yes. So she went over and bought a school? Yes. But you have it back then, again. And then, yeah, she made it into this and showed it at an exhibition. And then I thought it would be a great addition to the Wunderkammer wow. Wunder Gallery. So now it's in, in the collection again. You bought it back? Yes. Very cool. So I, I uh, guess this is going to be a glove from an astronaut, right? No, this is a, I have one in the vitrine that I will show you later that was actually used in space. This is a, a Russian prototype. So this was built in the early 2000s mm -hmm. um, when the Russians started thinking about the upcoming uh, Mars mission to fly to Mars. And this was a prototype of a glove that would withstand the harsh um, conditions on the planet But Mars. how do you prove the provenance of such a piece? I mean, I can tell by looking at a watch now if the watch is genuine, if, if it has been tampered with, if the hands are replaced. Yes. How can you tell this is really what it should be? Yeah, I also see it the same with watches. You don't buy the object, you buy the dealer. Fair play. So you, you trust the guy and then you, of course you have a feeling in, in your stomach it's after experience. doing this 15 years. And, um, and So you started 15 years ago? I think give or take, like doing small things like flea markets. and. So your first finds were just walking on a flea market, picking up some yeah, stuff. Yeah. And you're not only a collector, you're a dealer. So yeah. in the meantime, you went up and up and up. It's, made some it's money. a conflict, it's a big conflict being a collector and dealer because you have to get things sold but you don't want to because you actually want to keep it. But I have the yeah. same with watches, you know, so many times I'm selling a watch that I'd rather keep but you know, you need to make more money yes, to buy yes. a different watch exactly, again. Exactly. So that's, that's sometimes a hard piece. Uh, however, if you want to show us some more, yes. what do you think is a, <clears throat> is a piece you will never get rid of because you like it so much? Well, going back to my roots, in the taxidermy, this bird, um, it's called a, a Quetzal bird. Um, I found this... At so colorful. This is unbelievable. I found this completely destroyed and completely full of dust at, at the workshop of an old taxidermist. And that was the first time I was completely in awe of like an exotic bird. And I, I got it after persuading him for like two years that I really need it because I also thought it needed to be saved. So I had it completely restored by my friend Philip here in Zurich. And now it's back into its glory. And it's but is it that big business? I mean, you said it takes like two years to close such a deal. Do you sell yeah. some pieces every week or do you have a vast clientele that buys no. all your special pieces? Do you source, source on, a, on a request? Yeah, I do a lot of request things now. I'm not really interested in, in like this um, selling individual piece I'm more interested in like really working together with a collector building his collection um, that was really interesting me. so you have also other collectors that purchase from you yes. or also people that just want to have this moon suit or, or space suit to have it in their living room just to show <coughs> off yeah that's a fantastic piece from 1979 my birth year you see I'm an old man <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is from uh, the first alien movie Okay, so this is again a movie prop. Yes. yes. Okay, I thought they might have used this in space because you also had a space suit, right? Exactly, I sold that one. Yeah, yeah. And this is probably Thor's hammer. It is. <laughs> <laughs> used for the movie. It is. Wow. Yes, yes. But then you have something here where people in the 1780s, in late Edo period, uh, were really going into battle with. So that's a real. Um, Samurai armor. And so this is a real samurai armor. I'm sure this reminds you of something. Yeah, of a very traumatic experience. I took one in a trade. Also the guy told, yeah, it's a real late Edo period. And we have the sword. And I took it in a trade for a watch. And it cost me a couple of thousand euros. Okay. Because it was like a China shop edition. But then it turned out to be fake. It turned out to be okay. fake. But this is the real deal. Huh? This is the real deal. Very cool. So people actually battled in this one. Yes. 
It's unbelievable. Crazy. Just imagine like <clears throat> a couple of guys riding at you on a horse in, a, in an armor like this. You would be scared. Why does the mask have a mustache? Because actually masks in the old Japan were a lot of time done in a style of an old person. Because in, in the old Japan, old persons were always like uh, considered something more, like wisdom. more wisdom and also more scary. I want to trade you this. I can trade you this one. You want to trade me this against what? A watch. Which watch? This one? No, no, that's not enough. It doesn't cut it? No, no, no. You get the horns for that. I mean, literally. This guy's <laughs> squeezing me here. Are you serious? Is that is, yes. is that valuable? Yes. Then I should have known the one I bought, which was, was like eight thousand euros. It was yes, way too cheap. Yes. If it's too good to be true, it's, it's too good to be true. true. So that's what also important. I think I only I only buy pieces that interest me on a personal level. So because the Wunderkammer, the cabinet of curiosity, it goes back to the seventeenth century, mm -hmm. and it pretty much was kind of. Um, an eccentric collection of the guy who collected it. So yeah. it, it didn't really follow any rules. You could just collect anything. So I thought a uh, contemporary Wunderkammer needs to be also. It's a mix of everything for sure. Yeah. How did watches come into play? Because as I can see, you really enjoy finer objects. You enjoy objects with a story. Why watches? Where did that start it? Where well, did I think it go I, wrong? <laughs> yeah, I think I, I started doing it kind of a thing to make myself a present when I sold something nice. So uh, uh, I thought about what could it be and I was always fascinated by watches. I couldn't afford them when I was younger. And um, I think the first piece that really drew me in was the Explorer. For I like life. this one, man. Logical that kill dial is incredible. Yes. Can yes. I see it? Yes, sure. So, of course, here again, the story behind it. So that's an early 60s one. Um, yeah, exactly, with the gloss dial. Wow. And the stretch band. 6636 bracelet, incredible so, piece. Condition-wise, this is top of the bill. Is it also important when you collect your yes, curiosity, yes. like it needs to be pristine, Absolutely. otherwise it's, uh, it's not good enough? Yeah, this is when I, when I did the taxidermy things, I realized that they need to be perfect because if it's just a little off, it's just wrong. Yeah. And I think I, I try to be honest to that, to all my things that I collect. If it's movie props, taxidermy, antiques and watches, to only invest in... in and for watches, uh, specifically, specifically Rolex you collect or different brands? No, no, all over, all over. I also like, like small brands, uh, like I told you before, like Zodiac or any car. Or I think some the most watches we closed were Rolex, weren't they? Yeah, don't tell the me. first watch, the first watch was Rolex, though. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was like a little mishap, <laughs> little hiccup, <laughs> little hiccup. No, the, so the first watch we we closed was um, just Bombay a, Bombay Locks. How do you say Bombay Locks? Yeah, Bombay Locks. Bombay Locks. Date was it the day date or day just? No, it was always perpetual with Bombay Locks. That was the first okay. watch we closed yes. like three or four years ago. Yes. And ever since, I've been learning many stuff from you. You know, these kind of things are always interesting mm -hmm. and I really liked your idea of this watch. Yes, that was an idea that... Um, that's a piece I'm going to show you guys later. The, the kind of piece that made the idea for this. And then I saw you post this and I thought this is the perfect one to do this with because I want to make an, an original dial. Out of meteorite. Don't spoil it. <laughs> I already <laughs> said it in the intro, though. I already said, yeah. I did. Okay. So but that's, that's nice. gonna be dope. Yeah, that's nice. That's because it, be it's dope. a very small dial, so it's gonna be not too much uh, trouble for my um, goldsmith. Shout out to Andrea Capello in Zurich. <laughs> Fantastic Is guy. Is one? Yeah, I'm gonna show you some jewelry he made uh, later. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna ask him to make that dial. I think it, it's not gonna be too hard on this watch because it's square. It doesn't have any date we, uh, window it's gonna be or easy. something. Yeah. But you, you know Rolex already made meteorite dials, right? Yeah, but not from this meteorite. Okay, so this location already is secret. It's undisclosed. It's not it's, really it's a... It's on appointment. On appointment. It's a showroom. It's, it's, I like the fact that it's really private. Yes. But there's even an underground location, right? Yes. And over there we have the meteorite. Yes. Let's go. <laughs> it 
It's behind this door, I guess, huh? Yes, it is. <laughs> Can I open it? Yes, sure. <laughs> Damn, bro. <laughs> God, <laughs> even more doors. So this is the cabinet of metaphysical mysteries. <laughs> this is a great setting to discuss a watch deal. <laughs> yes. I love this. Yes. You already set us up. Yes, yeah, sure. I brought some other nice pieces to talk about and also about that idea that I had. Yeah. I mean, I'm a gemologist, so I'm pretty familiar with stones, but I have no clue what we're looking at right here. Okay, so let me just put this, this is the last one. So uh, first, uh, to start off, I mean, I was always fascinated by, by meteorites, stones that find uh, their way onto planet Earth mm -hmm. <coughs> by way of long interstellar travel. Um, sometimes these guys are on their way for millions of years, literally, they're just flying zigzag through the universe and by laws of gravitational pull, they get pulled to like this direction, this direction and then suddenly after a hundred thousand, a hundred thousands of years, they are onto the direct way onto our Earth. planet Earth. And then in the end they end up in a watch. <laughs> Sometimes, <laughs> yes. So here we have a classical iron meteorite. So this is like nothing special, special because it's just an iron meteorite, but it's a very beautiful and a big one. This it isn't specifically from a planet, is it? No, this is from the asteroid belt. Most of these are. Um, these little bumps you see here, these, are, um, they, these holes, they happen when it enters Earth atmosphere and little heat packets, like they go like crazy on the piece. Wow. Uh, while it goes through that incredible heat. So that's a, that's a nice piece, very heavy. And then one of the most beautiful ones um, that I found was um, from our... Yeah, I'll just show it. I mean, what thing you look sometimes at night when you feel... The moon, bro. Yes. So in here we have uh, an original piece. Of the moon. This is a piece of the moon? This is a piece of the moon. <laughs> Are you serious? Yes. Wow. And this is a very, very beautiful piece. It but it ended up on the Earth or it was yes. taken from the moon? <clears throat> no. No, you cannot. This is all belong to NASA. They don't sell it. It would cost millions if you would buy it off NASA. Um, this entered Earth atmosphere and, and it got very badly burned on the side, which is perfect. So it gives like a beautiful crust. That's how, like, among meteorite collectors, that's where the money is, or that's, like, the good pieces are. So, wait, there are actually meteorite collectors? Yes. I thought we were a little bit shifty collecting no, watches. No, but people not. collecting yes, meteorites? they are more shifty. Wow. That's this is a piece with a story. Incredible. Oh, yes, yes. But you're not going to ruin this to make a dial out of it for a no. Cellini. That would be stupid. No. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> this was uh, found in North uh, West Africa uh, only about, uh, I think, five years ago. So that's a pretty fresh piece. It's How long is it in your collection now? Uh, one and a half years. Yeah. Incredible. Prized possession. And then I thought, I, I knew that Rolex and other companies that did these meteorite dials, but I thought it would be really cool to make like a dial for a watch out of something that nobody has. It's so cool. Because what they use is this. This is what Rolex is using. They, they are using iron meteorites. So they cut it and it gives it that, you know, these shapes yeah. on, the, on all the dials of Which the Rolex. Which is pretty nice. It's yes. aesthetically pleasing. Wittmann, uh, Wittmannstetter Linien, they're called, after the guy who, in, who uh, found them. It, that's just like the inner structure of an iron meteorite. Okay, so they don't actually use a piece of a planet then? For no, the dial. No, not to my knowledge. Okay. But we are going to. We are going to. And we are now traveling even further. We are going to the red planet. Mars. Mars. <laughs> <laughs> so basically so we're getting a Mars dial. We're getting a Mars dial. That is incredible. And uh, this might be one of the biggest ones on Earth. So it can spare a couple of gram. So here we have... My friend, we can make a couple Yacht Mars for <laughs> out of this. This is so big. 2.2 kilos from planet Mars. 
<sighs> How are you ever going to use this to make a dial? Just slice it real yeah. thin? Isn't so that I hard? See, we already sliced it here. So you have to make, so of course, if you have something like this, you need to have it analyzed. Because mm -hmm. you, if you just go to a client and you say, I have a piece of Mars, they say, well, that sounds like a good story, but yes. So you cut it and then you can, we did like a first uh, primary analysis here at the university in Bern. <coughs> so he confirmed it to be Martian, like a Martian meteorite. But to be completely sure, it has to go into the extract, like, like with Patek Philippe. Yeah. So you send it in the States, this piece, and there's like two the guys in Washington and they will analyze it and then it will be put into the archive. That's Very why cool. we had to already cut it. So we already have space here that it doesn't really matter. So it's already hurt. That's yeah, enough space. I think it will look perfect. Yeah. So cool, man. Wow. I think I need a drink. Should yes, we head back to the, the main lounge? Absolutely. We're meeting another uh, watch collector, right? Yes, absolutely. Alex. Excellent. So it's good now with uh, Alex joining to be with the top two watch collectors of Zurich. Welcome, Alex. Am I right? <laughs> Happy to have you here, man. How long have you been dealing watches now? Uh, probably like five, four, three, four, three to five years. Probably. But you're not from Zurich, are you? No, no, no. I'm actually German and uh, I moved here like one and a half years ago. And, um, because of watches? Or? No, because of actually my main job and uh, I switched jobs and then I went to Zurich. And through a cool inc coincidence we met yes. with another watch collector and uh, yeah. How's the community in Zurich with watches? Terrible. It is? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that good? Yeah, Alex is the only honest watch dealer in Zurich. And in I the world, him. probably, because watch dealers are... No, you are half honest. <laughs> <laughs> So Christian, you wanted to say something? <laughs> Tell me. Tell the viewers that you want to buy their stuff at their attic. Yes, we are actually preparing a an, an very interesting auction next year. So we thought to ask you if you have in your attic or cellar hidden something special. Do you maybe have a piece of the moon in your attic? Or maybe uh, ET is hid in your attic? Or, Please? or a complete Russian spacesuit? Please message Wunderkammer Zürich and I'll get 10% of the cut. Eight. We make it nine. Congratulations. Cheers.